In this video, we're going to talk about everything that you want to and you need to know about hip labral tears. We'll talk about and we'll dispel some common misconceptions about hip labral tears, and we'll discuss the latest and greatest in non-surgical and surgical treatment options. Hello, this is Dr. Grant Cooper from Princeton Spine and Joint Center. The hip is a ball and socket joint, and the labrum of the hip is the cartilaginous lining of the socket of the hip joint. Sometimes the hip labrum can become torn and painful. When I was in fellowship training, I remember being at a conference and I was talking with a very famous hip surgeon at the time. The hip surgeon asked me how we treat labral tears where I was doing my fellowship. I told him that some did physical therapy, other patients had injections, and of course some patients needed surgery. Well, the hip surgeon shook his head and he told me that I was completely wrong. He said that all hip labral tears always need surgery. I think back to that interaction because I let the surgeon get away with that comment without my challenging it. Now, for one, I was at the low end of the totem pole at that point in my career, and at that moment, he was at the pinnacle. For another, I wasn't really armed with the data at my fingertips uh, that I wish I had. I wish I had pointed out to him, for one, that MRIs have shown an, an enormous number of asymptomatic hip labral tears. In one study of volunteers, volunteers who had no hip symptoms, and with a mean age of only 37 years old, 69% of all the hips had labral tears. So even in young adults, asymptomatic hip labral tears are common, and they become more common as we age. Clearly, we don't want to go operating on all of these pain-free hips. That would be crazy. But of course, hip labral tears sometimes do cause terrible, terrible pain. They can cause groin pain, buttock pain, thigh pain. The hip can lock. Uh, there can be a catching feeling or an instability in the hip. You can have pain with walking, pain with running, pain when you sit for a long time, pain with going up, going downstairs. Hip labral tears can make it hard to get in and out of the car. Pivoting can be very painful. Hip labral tears can be a nightmare. So why is it that one person will have a hip labral tear and will experience horrendous symptoms that keeps that person from enjoying life and doing basic activities of daily living? And another person will have a hip labral tear that looks the same on the MRI and yet the second person has no symptoms. Well, the answer is that what actually causes the pain is not so much the labral tear, or everyone with a labral tear would have pain, and we know that's not remotely the case, but rather what's causing the pain is if the body responds to that labral tear with inflammation. And it's that inflammatory response that is either going to cause pain or not. Now, what leads one person to develop inflammation and another person to not have an inflammatory reaction to a similar tear? Well, that's a great question, and in truth, we aren't really sure, but it clearly has something to do with the person's level of activity, the strength of the surrounding muscles, uh, the tightness of the muscles, their diet, medical history, genetics, and of course, that all-important good old-fashioned luck. So it's the inflammation that's either going to cause pain or not, and inflammation is really a protein response. But the best way for us to think about inflammation in this context is that it's like a fire, and there are two ways that we can put out a fire. One is we move away the sticks and let the fire die down on its own. In a surgeon's world, that means surgery. That is to say that the surgeon structurally fixes the tear. More on that in just a bit. In a non-surgical world, it generally means exercise. By stretching and strengthening the surrounding muscles, you take the pressure off of the affected hip and you try to allow that hip to rest so that the fire dies out. When you're rehabbing a hip labral tear, it's important to not just stretch and strengthen the hip muscles, but that you also want to make sure you're addressing the core stabilizing muscles. You need to evaluate the gait and see if you can improve someone's walking. You also want to look at the person's activities that may have led to the labral tear in the first place. So for example, painful hip labral tears are common in dancers, football, soccer players, and other types of athletes. So on one hand, some of that risk is just baked into the activity, but not all of the risk, and some of the risk can certainly be at least minimized. The first thing is to look at the form of the performing artist or the athlete. So if, if the person's a golfer, for example, you look at the golf swing to see if it's putting too much unnecessary torque on the hip. The same goes for dancers and everyone else. Then too, if you're a soccer player doing lots of quick pivots, you're gonna to need to do double the work on strengthening the muscles that allow you to make those fast pivots without putting too much stress on the hip. One other point when you're rehabbing a hip labral tear. It's not the norm, but sometimes someone develops a hip labral tear 
because they also happen to have a pinched nerve in the back. Specifically, the most common scenario, scenario is someone with an L5 pinched nerve. The L5 nerve root innervates the hip abductor muscles, and if the L5 isn't talking well with those muscles, then when you go to turn or to pivot or to land after a jump or, or just walk, the muscles that should be protecting your hip might not turn on as well or at the right time, and that will lead to extra stress on the hip, and that can lead to a hip labral tear. This is something you need to identify if it's present, because if you don't identify it, there's a strong tendency for the labral tear to become symptomatic again and again. If the back is involved, it's vitally important to address it one way or another so that as the hip labrum heals, the hip abductors will get the innervation that they need. Some sometimes addressing the L5 nerve root can just mean appropriate exercises devoted to the lumbar spine. At other times, it might mean an injection or even a surgery. Of course, the treatment is going to vary wide, wildly depending on how badly and from what the nerve is compromised. Let's return to the inflammation that we were fighting in the hip. Sometimes you move away the sticks with exercises, but that fire just keeps on wanting to burn. In these instances, you may need to put water on the fire. Water in this instance is generally one of four types of injections. The most common injection is an intraarticular steroid injection, a cortisone shot, right? Steroids are a powerful anti-inflammatory medication that can be delivered directly to the hip. The problem with steroid injections in the hip joint is that steroids aren't great for hip joints, particularly if you're doing repeated steroid injections. Realistically, one injection is very unlikely to harm the hip, but it's an important consideration because you don't want to find yourself in a pattern where you keep injecting the hip uh, again and again with steroids. That would lead to other kinds of worse problems. Another type of injection into the hip is Keterolac. Keterolac, uh, it's also called Toradol, is a liquid NSAID, like a liquid Advil or Aleve. Studies have shown that injecting Toradol for hip osteoarthritis may work as well as steroids. It stands to reason then that this would hold true for hip labral tears as well. The advantage of this approach is that Toradol does not have the same potential deleterious effects on the hip joint, so that makes Toradol very attractive. The main disadvantages are one, some people might have a contraindication to NSAID, so then they couldn't have it. And two, there just hasn't been nearly as much experience or data overall with injectable Toradol as there has been with steroids. Still, it's something to consider. A third type of injection is a very different approach. One can inject viscosupplementation. Viscosupplementation is basically a synthetic joint fluid. This joint fluid can be injected into the hip joint. I had a fellowship director that used to like to say the labral tear is like a pothole in the road and the visco supplementation paves over the pothole. The nice thing about this approach is that you're putting a joint fluid into the joint that belongs in the joint. So in a way, it's a more organic or, or natural uh, treatment. It tends to work, at least in my experience, very well for this purpose. Data is very strong for using visco supplementation for hip osteoarthritis. But to be fair, more studies are needed to solidify this for hip labral tears as the standard of care. Right now, it's more empiric clinical data from people who do this a lot for their patients. The fourth type of injection is regenerative medicine. In regenerative medicine, the labral tear is prompted to repair itself by eject injecting around it using one of a few different kinds of products. Regenerative techniques are becoming more popular with each passing year and there's slowly a growing body of research that's starting to support its usage. The most popular regenerative technique for hip labral tears is probably PRP. This is a procedure where you aspirate the patient's blood, you use a centrifuge to spin down the platelets and growth factors, and then you inject those platelets and growth factors back into the pathologic site with the idea that the growth factors and the platelets will attract the body's own healing mechanisms. Other similar techniques would include injectable prolotherapy, amniotic fluid, bone marrow aspirate, and there's a, there, there are several other approaches that all try to basically try to get the body to heal itself. A major drawback for all of these approaches is that insurance almost never covers any of them. And this is because while evidence for them is certainly growing, it remains relatively sparse. Now, personally, if PRP were a covered procedure, I would often recommend PRP particularly in lieu of steroid injections. However, regenerative medicine techniques can be very expensive. They usually cost between $750 and $3,000 or more 
depending on the particular doctor and the particular regenerative technique that's being considered. Importantly, if an injection is being performed, it must, absolutely must be done under some kind of image guidance. You can use fluoroscopy, which is a movable low-dose x-ray, or you can use ultrasound. But without image guidance, you can't be sure that your needle is where it needs to be. For all joints, injections using image guidance is advisable, but for the hip, it is absolutely non-negotiable. Now, back to the fire analogy. If you're throwing water on the fire with an injection, it's always best to think of that injection as providing a window of opportunity to allow you to learn some exercises to start changing the mechanics so the fire doesn't return in a few months. Like if all you do is a steroid shot and you don't follow with exercises and improving the overall biomechanics, well, steroid shots tend to work about three months on average on their own. If all you do is visco supplementation, you tend to get about six months of relief. The way to make injections a part of a comprehensive treatment that fixes the problem instead of just putting a Band-Aid on it is to couple the injection with the appropriate exercises and the appropriate attention to the biomechanics. For most people with a hip labral tear, some combination of improving the biomechanics of the day, such as evaluating the sports mechanics, possibly limiting excessive repetitive internal and external rotation of the hip during activities such as yoga, using physical therapy exercises and an image-guided steroid injection or some other injection will typically fix the problem when these modalities are used in combination. But of course, nothing is 100%, and look, sometimes this won't work. In a young person with an isolated hip labral tear that's not responding well to conservative care, an arthroscopic surgery may be an excellent alternative. It typically takes about three to six months to return to sport, and it's generally a very well-tolerated surgery. If, however, the hip labral tear is in someone a little older who also has arthritis in the hip, then it gets much more complicated. Depending on the extent of the concomitant arthritis, arthroscopic surgery might not be an option, and then the only surgical alternative may be to do a hip replacement. This is obviously a much bigger surgery with much larger ramifications, so this must be considered you know, carefully, of course. An important point is that if surgery is needed, the stronger you go into a surgery, the stronger and the quicker you'll, quicker you'll come out of it. A lot of times, if someone's going to go for surgery, they stop moving and they stop doing any rehab exercises because they figure that they'll just wait until their hip is fixed. This is almost always a mistake because the muscles that you'll need after the surgery will become weaker and more atrophied. So even if you're going to go for surgery, and maybe especially if you're going to go for surgery, the more you can work with a physical therapist on structured exercises for you, the easier time that you're going to have on the back end of surgery. It's also important to note that even if you have surgery, it doesn't mean that you can't re-tear your labrum. So it's still important to look at why the tear happened in the first place and look to correct those issues after an arthroscopic surgery so that you don't have to go through this whole thing again. Thank you very much. As always, if you have any questions or comments, uh, for, or if you have any requests for future videos, please leave us a comment in the comment section. Please remember to hit the like button. It helps us with our YouTube algorithm. Um, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. We really appreciate your support. Thank you very much.